and welcome to the lecture accompanying chapter four from Hewitt, 12th edition for the book Conceptual Physics. In this chapter, titled Newton's Second Law of Motion, we're going to explore exactly that. Newton's Second Law of Motion, which is really the law of acceleration. All right, so we're going to talk about how forces cause acceleration, talk about a, a particular force called the friction force, talk about the, the difference between mass and weight, formally define Newton's second law of motion, talk about free fall, and then finally non-free fall, in other words, falling with air resistance. All right, so acceleration is directly proportional to net force. To increase the acceleration of an object, you have to increase the net force acting on it. So this is the proportionality, and this is the precursor to Newton's second law, all right? And that's what the, the symbol here, by the way, is the proportionality symbol. So if you see that, that tilde, that's a um, proportional, okay? So one goes up, the other one goes up. This is opposed to something that's inversely proportional, which when one thing goes up, the other one goes down. This is direct proportionality, okay? All right, so what about the force of friction? What is it, okay? So the force of friction depends on the kinds of material and how much they are pressed together. So if I wanna know the force of friction between two things, I need to know what those two things are made of. And you can look up the so-called friction coefficient between materials. So there, it might be Teflon on snow or wood on wood. You know, so the idea is that, that those material combinations will lead to a certain friction coefficient, which tells you how much they stick together. Okay? The actual cause of friction is due to tiny surface bumps and the stickiness of the atoms on the material surface. So the atoms might hold together by certain forces, um, you know, tiny um, electrostatic forces, atomic forces, and so on, molecular forces. All right. So the force of friction can occur, what do you think? Well, sliding objects in water and air, all of the above. All right, got a good guess? All of the above, all right? Air resistance is a kind of friction. Water drag is a kind of friction. Certainly sliding um, one object across another is another form of friction. Sometimes we refer to air friction as air resistance, but the principle is the same. It's about the actual, like, the microscopic scale interactions between substances, even if the substance is a fluid, like a gas or a liquid. When Sanjay pushes a refrigerator across the kitchen floor at a constant speed, the force of friction between the refrigerator and the floor is... So, the reason we already know the answer to this is because we already know Newton's first law, okay? Of course, we're just beginning to understand Newton's second law, but we already know the first one, right? The first law, the law of inertia says the object will remain in motion at constant speed, okay, unless an external force acts on it. Well, we're told that Sanja here is maintaining constant speed. So what does that tell us? Make sure you can see the answer. It has to be equal because only if the friction is equal and opposite in direction to Sanjay's pushing force is the net force zero and thus the speed is constant. Newton's first law. When Sanjay pushes a refrigerator across a kitchen floor at an increasing speed, the amount of friction between the refrigerator and the floor is, hmm, well increasing speed, that's code for acceleration, right? One of the big topics of this chapter, and we've already defined acceleration in the previous chapter, right? We kind of had, we took a step away from Newton's laws to make sure we we're grounded in terms of understanding what acceleration is and how it relates to velocity. But now we're going to relate acceleration back to force, which we saw two chapters ago. But the point is, what does this tell us? What does this tell us about the friction force? We know it must compare in a certain way to Sanjay's push, and that is, pause it if you need to, it's got to be less, must be less than Sanjay's pushing force only then would it be speeding up. In fact, if the friction force was less than Sanjay's push and was already in motion, say he was kind of like, he, he'd maybe been pushing more before and started pushing less, then it would actually be decelerating, be slowing down, okay? So, mass and weight, what's the difference? So mass is the quantity of matter in an object. It is actually counting the number of atoms and how much atomic mass every atom has. It is invariable. Mass is a state of that matter. Okay, and it's directly related to inertia. Mass and inertia have the same units because inertia in straight lines is one and the same as mass. There's another form of inertia called rotational inertia, but story for another day. The important thing is inertia and mass, they're synonyms, okay? Now weight is totally different though. Weight is the force upon an object due to gravity. 
Okay. And that's usually. Because you can have apparent weight due to things that aren't gravity, like the centripetal force. You can have apparent weight. Think about all those um, uh, it's kind of like um, sci-fi movies where they have big spinning space stations and they create artificial gravity of spinning space stations. Some sci-fi movies just kind of do away with it and, do away with it and just say, oh, we have artificial gravity, so don't worry about it. But those will actually show large spinning space stations. Well, that's one way to create weight, but it wouldn't be creating weight through gravity. All right? But usually, weight comes from gravity. And your weight then is dependent on where you are. Okay? Your mass is unchanging, but your weight is dependent on location. Okay? So, in summary, mass, a measure of the inertia of a material object, independent of gravity. Unit is the kilogram. Weight is connected to gravity. The unit is the newton, the same unit we use for force. And we also can use pounds. So when we talk about weight, and we talk about how heavy we are, and a pound, well, a pound is actually a force. It's not a mass. Okay? So does that matter in most cases? I mean, because you can have a scale switch back and forth between kilograms of mass and pounds of force. So that scale is fine. It can switch back in between them, but it's making an assumption that the scale is on Earth. If I took my scale with pound mode and kilogram mode, and I took it at the moon, it would be totally wrong because it's actually doing a calculation, whether an analog or digital calculation within the scale, accounting for its gravity. Okay? So because they are fundamentally different units. In fact, if you do want to consider what is the equivalent of a mass measurement in the American you know, non-metric system, it's actually called the slug. It's not used very often, but that is actually our official unit of mass. Okay? So if the mass of an object is halved, the weight of the object is what? All right? Bet you know this one. Also halved, right? Because gravity is the same on both of them, so cutting the mass in half means half the weight. Okay? Mass and weight in everyday conversation are interchangeable. Absolutely. All right? And that's kind of why in a physics class we go out of our way to make sure that we have this little bit of explanation because we're used to them being interchangeable. We know for most people they're interchangeable. But there is obviously very important differences. They're different units. One is a force and one isn't. You know, there's, so we have to realize in this context of physics, there's a difference. Mass, however, is different and more fundamental. Okay? And this is the idea that on the moon and the earth, Weight would be different, but mass would be the same. Okay? One kilogram weighs 10 newtons, 9.8 newtons to be more precise, on Earth. Okay? One kilogram weighs 10 newtons. Why is that? Okay? Well, that's because it's mass times acceleration. Okay? And we'll get, you'll see this again. That's because the weight is mass times acceleration. And this is really hinting at directly Newton's second law, which we're just about to see. Okay? We have a force equaling ma. All right? And quick conversion here. One kilogram is about 2.2 pounds, which is about 10 Newtons. Okay? Are they exactly equal? No, because they're different, different units, right? So these are more, this is like the idea that they're proportional to each other. Okay? Because again, it's not exactly accurate to say they're equal, but except in everyday non-scientific situations. This, however, is a perfectly fine conversion. One pound is 4.5 newtons because these are both forces. Okay? So, let's check our understanding here and intuition. When the string is pulled down slowly, the top string breaks. What does that illustrate? What principle? We're pulling it slowly. Okay? the weight of the ball. Because when we pull it slowly, we're effectively making the ball heavier. Because the tension then becomes the weight plus the pull. Okay? So we're just pulling it more and more. We're, ma we're effectively making the hanging ball heavier. Because we're kind of just adding our passive slow pull weight. Right? We're almost adding like the weight of our arm. If we just held on to it and let our arm go go lax, go loose. We would be kind of just adding the weight of our arm. That's what a slow pull is like. We're just adding weight. Okay? On the other hand, if you pull this string quickly, the bottom string will break. All right? Got to pull really fast. That works. In fact, it's very similar to the idea of pulling the tablecloth out from underneath a set table. All right? You have to do it fast. And what property does that illustrate? Well, 
inertia, the mass of the ball, not the weight. See the difference? Because it's the laziness. Because remember, inertia is the laziness of matter. Laziness of matter. That's a fun way to think about it. Because that's what inertia is, right? Inertia is the resistance of matter to change. Okay? And that's it. It doesn't want to be accelerated really quickly. And if you try to accelerate it really quickly, well, something's going to have to give. It's the bottom string. Okay. So, another proportionality, and we'll formally introduce Newton's second law. So, the same force... The same force applied to twice the mass produces half the acceleration. Three times the mass produces one-third the acceleration. Okay? So the greater the mass, the harder it is to accelerate. So that tells us that we have an inverse proportionality. Acceleration is proportional to one over mass. Or we say that acceleration is inversely proportional to mass. If, acceler if mass goes up, acceleration goes down. Okay? Make sense? All right. And... I would say that mass is usually the independent variable in this case. So if mass goes up, acceleration goes down. So now how do we bring this all together? Because so far we've got two, two proportionalities. Direct proportionality between force and acceleration, inverse proportionality between acceleration and mass. Well, you bring them all together, you're going to get Newton's second law. Isaac Newton was the first to connect the concepts of force and mass to produce acceleration. What does it look like? Okay, here it is in, in word form. Newton's second law called the law of acceleration in kind of colloquial terms, relates acceleration and force. The acceleration produced by a net force on an object is directly proportional to the net force, is in the same direction as the net force, so there's its vector relationship, okay? they both, both have to absolutely point in the same direction, and is inversely proportional to the mass of the object. That's it, right? What does it look like? This is what it looks like in equation form. It's acceleration, A for acceleration, usually lowercase a, equals net force over m. And we could actually rewrite that in the way that you may have seen it before. This is by far the most famous representation of it. We multiply both sides by m, cancel out over here, rearrange a bit, and we've got net force. People usually drop the net, but it's actually very important. Net force equals ma. F equals ma. Newton's second law. Okay, along with E equals mc squared, one of the most famous laws in physics. These short laws, you know, people love them. They're succinct. They're beautiful, right? They're kind of fun. If net force acting on an examples here, if net force acting on an object is doubled, the object's acceleration will be doubled. Okay? Oh, wow. We knew that. That's, we saw that. It's direct proportionality. If the mass of an object is doubled, the object's accel acceleration will be halved. Oh, we just saw that too. So that's what Newton's second law is. It's taking both the proportionalities, the direct one and the inverse one, and putting it all into one law. And notice here, it's an equal sign, not a proportionality anymore because the units match up. Proportionalities aren't unit equivalent. Equations are, okay? That means the units on both sides of this equal sign have to be the same. Over here on the acceleration side, they're m over s squared, meters per second squared. On this side, they must be the same. Well, are they? Well, what is a Newton, okay? A Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, and a mass is just an m, all right? So, excuse me, a kilo, it's a kg. And so then the kgs cancel, and of course we're just left with meters per second squared on both sides. All right? The reason why I was thinking m for the variable for mass, but the units are kg. All right, so here's just further illustrations, a good kind of picture summary, but it's not, nothing that we haven't already talked about. All right, so quick check, let's consider it. Consider a cart pushed along a track with a certain force. If the force remains the same while the mass of the cart decreases to half, the acceleration of the cart, but you can figure it out, right? Flip back to slides if you need to, doubles, okay? Of course it doubles, okay? Push a cart along a track so twice as much net force acts on it. If the acceleration remains the same, what is the reasonable explanation? What must have happened? Okay, push your cart. Twice as much net force acts on it. If the acceleration doesn't change, that means mass must, must have changed. Yep, must have doubled to keep up with it. Okay, that's the only way it wouldn't have accelerated more because it's twice the push. You should get twice the acceleration unless the mass doubles because things that are more massive are harder to accelerate. All right? Okay, so 
What about free fall? Right? How does free fall relate to all this? Well, free fall is driven by a force, okay? And it creates an acceleration. So we see how this is a good, this is a good fit for Newton's second law. Okay? So the greater the mass of the object, the greater its force of attraction towards the Earth. Okay? So we're not all pulled with the same force. My gravitational pull is directly proportional to my mass. If you weigh more or less than me, then you're going to experience a greater gravitational force. However, we're all going to experience the same gravitational acceleration. Okay? The smaller its tendency to move, that is, the greater its inertia. Right? That's that idea of the laziness of matter. So acceleration of both sets of bricks is the same. See? Twice the force on twice the mass. Aha! See that? Here's something that weighs a mass of 1, just kind of arbitrary in m. Oh, excuse me, an m. All right? So in that case, f over m is g. But if I double the mass, then I double the force. Now, I'm not explaining why that is, right? I'm just saying that this is, this is just take it as a truth. Twice as much mass, twice as much gravitational force. It turns out there's a reason for that. It's called the universal law of gravitation. We'll talk about it. It's often also called Newton's universal law of gravitation. In the sense, it's Newton's fourth law, okay? But for now, we're just taking it as gospel. You double the mass, you double the inertia of something, that means you double the gravitational pull on it. But because of that, if we do just take that as fact, then we do see that g is a constant. Every object accelerates at the same rate, okay? At least in a vacuum, because that, that's free fall. Free fall means no air resistance. That's actually the definition of free fall. The only thing is gravity, okay? And we talked about that in the last chapter. But good thing, good thing to remind us about, okay? So the acceleration of both sets of bricks is exactly 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? And again, always use 9.8 unless you're told to round to 10, all right? So, at one instant, an object in free fall has a speed of 40 meters per second. Its speed one second later is what? So throw back to the last chapter, good review. What's that rate of the velocity change, right? So it's approximately 50, because it approximately speeds up 10 meters per second per second. That's, that's that 10 meters per second squared, 10 meters per second per second, okay? A 5 kilogram iron bar, now to, now to the forces, right now to the new stuff, and a 10 kilogram iron ball, uh, ball are dropped from rest. For negligible air resistance, the acceleration of the heavier ball will be, if you're paying attention, you know, the same. Absolutely. Because the heavier ball, the 10 kilogram ball, experiences twice the gravitational pull. All right? How much, right? Well, the pull on the 5 kilogram is approximately, well, just five times 10, so 50 Newtons. The pull, I just wanna you know, put this in numbers, you really see, right? The 10 kilogram one is approximately 100 Newtons, right? Because every, every time you wanna convert a mass to a weight on Earth, and you wanna be approximate about it, you just multiply by 10, because F gravity is just mg. Okay? Okay. A 5 kilogram iron ball and a 10 kilogram iron ball are dropped from rest. When the free falling 5 kilogram ball reaches the speed of 10 meters per second, the speed of the free falling 10 kilogram ball is what? The same. That's the idea. If they have the same acceleration, then they must reach the same speed at the same time. Assuming they both started at rest, right? At the same instant. Okay. Get review from the last chapter. Okay. So non-free fall, last topic here. When an object falls downwards through the air, it experiences the force of gravity pulling it downwards plus air drag, this is resistance, R for resistance, going up, okay? We know this because skydivers don't speed up indefinitely. Skydivers reach a terminal velocity, okay? So we, you know, we've, we've, seen, we've seen definitely at least videos of the idea of air resistance. And we see it with like, I mean, certainly feathers, you know, things like paper, you know, these objects that have a lot of surface area, they experience really large air resistance relative to their gravitational force, okay? Because they're light, so small gravitational force, big surface area turns out to be a lot of air resistance. And of course, big surface area means lots of air resistance. That's, you know, that's how sails work. You know, you get big, big wall of, of something, cloth or just an object blocking, blocking the air, pushes it around, you know? Not even getting to the explanation of where air resistance comes from. There's a common sense there, right? So the conditions of non-free fall occurs when air resistance is non-negligible, 
Okay, that's going to be for a lot of cases. Okay, especially on Earth with an atmosphere. Depends on two things: the speed and the surface area. Okay, so surface area one. Again, I, I was hopefully you know convincing you that one makes sense. As far as the speed, that's kind of less intuitive, but it's important to remember: the faster you're going, the greater the air resistance. All right. So it has because you're pushing more air molecules out of the out of the way at a greater rate. Right? So kind of, you know, because the air molecules are just sitting there, if you're going through them really fast, you've got to push more of them out of the way. Thus, the air is having a greater effect on your movement. So when the object is moving fast enough so that air resistance builds up to equal the force of gravity, all right, at that point, acceleration is over, the velocity doesn't change, and that is known as terminal velocity. Because what you have here is a word that starts with E, Right? Because at that point, when there's no acceleration, velocity not changing, what do we call that? That's equilibrium. Okay? So an object that has been falling for a long time with non-negligible air resistance reaches the state of equilibrium eventually, known as terminal velocity. Okay? A state of non-acceleration, a state of net force equaling zero because R equals mg. mg is the gravitational force, R is the air resistance drag force. Okay? Terminal speed, just described it. Terminal velocity, same as terminal speed, but we give it direction. It's going to be down, okay? Skydiver in fall after jumping from a plane, the weight and air resistance act on the falling object. As the falling speed increases, air resistance on the, on the diver builds up, okay? Because again, the relationship between the drag force and speed is as speed goes up, drag force goes up. That's why it gradually increases until it meets mg, equaling in magnitude. Net force is reduced, the acceleration becomes less. Eventually, Net force is zero, thus acceleration is zero, right? Because think, F equals mg, okay? Well, here, it's not g, it's a, right? Because there's more than one force. And so if F goes to zero, so much a, because m can't go to zero. It's not like your mass has disappeared because you got more air resistance, okay? Mass remains unchanged. So, when a 20 Newton falling object encounters a 5 Newtons of air resistance, the acceleration of fall is, think about that one carefully, less than G. Because the net force in that case is 15. That, yeah, we could actually exactly find out the rate, 7.5. Check out this equation. This comes from F equals MA. We already know F, it's 15. We already know M, it's 2 kilograms. Okay, and we just solve for A. We just take 15 divided by 2, gives us 7.5. So we can actually exactly solve for the acceleration. And if this person continued to fall, that 5 number is just going to get bigger and bigger until it eventually matches 20, and then A becomes 0. Okay, right? I know I'm, I know I'm repeating myself, but you know, this is, I want to see this idea from different angles. Okay? So 50 Newton person is, is to um, fall at a terminal speed. The air resistance needed is... Ah, uh, did you know it? Right. Pause if you need a, need a moment. It's got to be equal because we need the sum of forces F net to equal zero. Remember summation symbol right there? All right. As the skydiver falls faster and faster through the air, air resistance increases. As the, sky, as the skydiver continues to fall faster and faster through the air, net force, uh, make sure, pause if you need to, decreases eventually to zero. As the skydiver continues to fall faster and faster through the air, her acceleration... Well, think Newton's second law. If F net is approaching zero, acceleration must also approach zero, so it decreases. Consider a heavy and a light person jumping together with the same size parachutes from the same altitude. Who will reach the ground first? Oh, that's a good one. All right? All right. Well, I won't tell you the answer right on that one because I want to leave that hanging. Of course, you can look it up in the slides, okay? But it'd be fun to, fun to leave it out, maybe motivate you to actually look it up, okay? So... But we've seen, we've seen some big ideas here. We saw Newton's second law. We saw for how it relates to free fall, how it, how it ties together everything we saw, saw in the last chapter in terms of acceleration. And we saw something really new, the idea of non-free fall. Okay? All right. Well, thank you so much for watching. And stay tuned for the accompanying lecture for Chapter 6. Okay? Um, oh, excuse me, Chapter 5. Thanks so much. Bye.